It's time for the Revival Now podcast with James Brandt right here on the Luke 418 radio network. Get ready to receive a word from the Holy Spirit. Get ready to experience revival. Psalm 34, 7. Here we go. It says, The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Jump with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews 1, 13 and 14. It says, to, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. Now that that verse is talking about how Jesus is so much greater than the angels. Amen? So today I want to talk about this very intriguing topic in the Word of God. I want to talk about, as you know, on the topic of angels today. The title of this message is this, Angels on Assignment. Angels on assignment. You see, many Christians, I say this all the time, because many Christians get paranoid. They get paranoid about this topic because they think people are going to start worshiping angels. All right? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Someone probably warned you in the past about that, right? But here's what's going on. The enemy is trying to scare Christians out of knowing more about the resources that are available to us in the kingdom of God. If there's a topic in the Word of God, how many of you know it's fair game? It's fair game. Obviously, if God put it in His Word, He wants us to know a little something about it. And there's a good reason why, which I'm going to talk about here. But how many of you know people can, of course, get caught up in the flesh on any topic? Say any topic. Not just angels. On any topic. So here is my warning and boundary on this topic of angels. You must understand that angels and every spiritual being in the spirit realm, they are created beings just like you and I. They are created beings, okay? Now, there are different levels, uh, different ranks of angels or ministering spirits, okay? So when I say angels or ministering spirits, I'm kind of using that interchangeably. Now, the word minister, they're ministering spirits, all right? The word minister is defined as this, to attend to the needs of someone. To attend to... To the needs of someone. They are ministering spirits. They attend to the needs of us. See, here's the deal. The devil doesn't want you to know this. So angels are sent to attend to our needs. And they are to minister, it's, the Word of God says, to the heirs of salvation. All right. Now, there's different sizes and shapes of angels. On the angelic encounters I've had, I've seen many different shapes and sizes. I mean, I'm telling you right now, some can't even wouldn't be able to take what I would say to you because maybe you're not you're not spiritually strong enough to handle it. You'll think it's kind of stupid, but I don't care. <laughs> I've seen what I've seen. I know what I know. Amen. There's times when I was in that in Big Rapids at, at, during that time. Wasn't that amazing? Supernatural. Supernatural. We, we'd be walking in the sanctuary, and I would see like helicopter-looking things going around and around. We would see them manifest like lightning in the sanctuary. I've seen one age, I was just telling Jeff and Jamie this morning, I've seen one when I was walking in the sanctuary praying that one... What, it was, it was just a short thing, and it had wings flapping, and it went above the sanctuary doors. And it, I, I kid you not, God is my witness, it had like a bucket, and it went above the door, and it went like this, and gold dust started falling to the ground. The spirit realm is so deep, 
You, you can't even imagine. I mean, it's beyond your wildest imagination what God has created, okay? I just tell you that to say that it is deep, and, and God's angels are absolutely amazing, amen? But even more amazing is the God that created them. Are you following me? So the thing here, the thing that's so intriguing about angels, about ministering spirits, is the supernatural aspect of them. They are very supernatural. Amen? They are powerful. And they carry with them. Here's what it is. The angels carry with them the presence of God on them. Why? Because they're constantly traveling between heaven and earth. So when they come to earth, they have the presence of heaven, the presence of God upon them. In fact, living creatures, the Word of God is very clear, that living creatures, when God's presence manifests, that they, they are, um, what's the word I want to look for? They usher in the presence of God. Where the glory goes, they go. When you feel the presence of God, there's angels in the room. It's not just God. It's the presence of angels that have the presence of God on them. I'm speaking some deep things. Are you guys all right this morning? Are you, can you handle it? Okay. I'm trying to help you out. I'm trying to give you a deeper understanding of what's going on in the spirit realm, the invisible realm around us. Amen. Gabriel, when he appeared to Zechariah, he said, I am Gabriel and I, st- I stood in the presence of God. They're coming. Jacob's ladder going to and from between heaven and earth. Are you following me? So there is an awe. There is an awe about angels that has a potential to tug on your flesh to get you to focus on them instead of God and His Word. But I will tell you this. Anytime anytime someone had an encounter with them, it was an amazing experience. It was life-changing. The Word of God came alive to them. Amen? Whenever a person would try to bow down and worship the angel, the angel always corrected them and says, don't do that for me. Worship God. See, I'm coming from this whole topic from a, the Word of God perspective. I'm not pulling you into something that's not Word. I'm, wor- I'm a Word man. Are you following me? Amen. 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 So all of the angelic encounters that I've ever had in my life, here's what happened. It didn't tug on my flesh. Here's what happened. It drew me closer to God. It made me realize how awesome God is in creating all these things. It it gave me an awe of God. It drew me closer to Him. Amen? And I think it's a matter of this, too. It's a matter of spiritual maturity in a person. Right? A spiritual mature Christian will always keep in mind and focus and direct their praise and worship to God and not to the created thing. Are you following me? We worship the Creator. So I think there's a sense of uh, uh, spiritual maturity that kind of plays into that as well. But if you desire to have angelic assistance in your life, does anybody desire to have angelic assistance in your life? All right. You need to keep God at the center of your praise and worship and not the angels. In fact, it'll make, if, if, if they are the center and not God, it will make them back off. It'll make them back off. Because they know, here's what they have a revelation of, the holiness of God. They know that God is greater than anything. They have that revelation. Now we as humans, we kind of deal with the flesh and all these fleshly things that we got to root out. Are you following me? But they have pure knowledge and understanding of the holiness of God. And none of that worship goes to the created thing, but to the Creator. Amen? So the Holy Spirit gave me some important points to share with you today about this topic of angels and their function in our life. Okay? Let's jump right into this. Why should we know and study this biblical topic? Of angels. Why? Some of you are saying, why do we even talk about it, right? Because we need to know, like I said earlier, we need to know what is available to us in the kingdom of God. All right? They are co laborers with us in the advancement of the kingdom. I want to know that I'm not hindering their job. They're not going to hinder my job, but I don't want to hinder their job in the spirit realm. Are you following me? We need to know their function and the role they role they play so we can promote. Uh, and, and not hinder them in our life. I don't know about you, but I want to co-labor with them to advance the kingdom. I don't want to stop it because I don't know. 
about you, but if you watch the news lately, we need all the supernatural help we can get. We need all the supernatural help we can get. So if you view them, angels, ministering spirits, uh, as fellow laborers in the kingdom of God, it will prevent you from falling into the worship of them. We're just working together on one purpose, to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Amen? So we need to focus on our and their creator. But again, God obviously wants us to know some things about angels because the Word of God mentions them, and there are quite a few accounts in the Word of God. Have you, have you noticed that when you read the Word? There's quite a, it talks about angels quite a bit. So angels and or ministering spirits, they are technically not male or female. They're neither male nor female, technically. They are spirit beings. Now, when you read the Word, they're portrayed more in a male form. But officially, they're not male or female. Let's look at Psalm 34, 7. Uh, One more time. Psalm 34, 7, one more time. Here we go. We're diving right into this. It says, The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Now, the Hebrew word that's translated angel means messenger or to send. All right? The word angel means messenger. You guys doing all right? So the angel of the Lord is a messenger or a representative for the Lord. Okay? So there are accounts, if you'll notice in the word, if you do a study on the, on the, uh, of the angel of the Lord, you'll do a study and you'll notice that some accounts make it sound like it's a separate angel or some accounts make it sound like it's the Lord himself in that place. Are you following me? Now, here's what my, my thought is on that. My thought is that it's an angel sent from the Lord as a representative that is speaking and acting on behalf of the Lord, okay? Now, this is not a salvation issue. That's why we can kind of talk about this, right? Your salvation is not dependent on whether you believe that or not. Hello, you understand what I'm saying? Okay. You do your own praying and seeking the Lord on that one. But it says the angel or messenger of the Lord encamps all around those who fear or reverence him. The fear, the fear or reverence or submission is not to the angel, but to the Lord. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him. Who's him in that verse? Who's him in that sentence? Well, it's obviously not the angel. It's fearing the Lord. Are you following me? But of course, reverence the Lord, reverencing the Lord means you're gonna you're gonna be respectful to his messengers as well. Are you following me? Yeah. Remember uh, when when an angel appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus? What's what did the what did the Lord say to Saul? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was killing Christians. But Jesus took it personally. So if angels encamp Christians that fear the Lord, then we can, we can assume the opposite then, right? They do not encamp those who do not fear the Lord, and they will not deliver those Christians. If the angel of the Lord encamps around about those that fear the Lord and delivers them, the opposite is true. If you don't fear the Lord, angels won't do that. Oh, come on, somebody. Maybe you never heard that before. The Word of God says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And in Proverbs 8.13, in fact, go there. Proverbs 8.13. Let's look at this real quick. We need to know all of the resources available to us in the kingdom of God on this earth. Amen? Amen? It says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. So that means, are you ready for this? Let's go deeper. To the degree that you and I as Christians, this ain't talking about the unbeliever, they love evil. Are you following me? People love putting pornography in the children and children and teens section of a library. Are you following me? It's talking about Christians here. So that means this, the de- to the degree that you hate evil in your life as a Christian, that you love righteousness, is the degree to which you and I will have angelic assistance in our life. 
I didn't say it. The Word of God said it. That you determine the level of angelic assistance in your own life. So the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And then in in Proverbs 8.13, it goes on to list pride and arrogance, the evil way and a perverse mouth, perverse spoken words out of our mouth. So what this is saying then, if the angel of the Lord encamps those that fear him, or they won't encamp those that do not fear him, All of those things in Proverbs 8.13, it says it will hinder angelic assistance in our life. Because it's a lack of the fear of the Lord. Now go with me to Acts 12. Oh, we're, we're going deeper. Trust me, we haven't even scratched the surface yet. I got nine full pages again. You're welcome. And I'm only on three, okay? Here we go. Acts 12. Verses 5 through 11 here. Anybody want to know about this topic? All right. All right. Great. Here we go. Listen. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. And the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord, a messenger of the Lord, stood by him, by Peter, and a light shone in the prison. And he was, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. All of this is supernatural, by the way. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. Angels are very practical, by the way, right? Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done, uh, did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Here's what happens. When you're in the spirit, you feel like you're dreaming. Your, your, your senses are so heightened, is so aware, your spiritual senses, it almost feels like you're in a dream. And that's what Peter was experiencing right there. Are you following me? When they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectations of the Jewish people. It says this. It says that constant prayer was offered to God for Peter by the church. So they had a little prayer meeting at, uh, in a building, Christians, and they're saying, Lord, deliver Peter from this prison. The Holy Spirit spoke this to me. Are you ready? He said this. He said, if Peter wasn't in obedience to my will, and if he didn't fear me, the angel would have never been sent to help him out of prison. Did you catch that? See, here's what you got to know. We as Christians carry most of the responsibility, unless for some reason in a sovereign way God moves for some purpose. God doesn't do anything randomly. You know that, right? You heard that in my messages. Nothing is random by God. There's always a purpose. But we carry most of the responsibility toward the activity of angels in our life. And he said this, some aren't delivered because there's no fear of the Lord and they're out of the will of God for their life. And those people get angry at God. Are you following me? We got to be in the will of God. We've got to be in the will of God. I've seen it so many times, Christians getting angry. And you can see it clear as a day, they're not in the will of God. And their life sure isn't living with the fear of the Lord. Hello, somebody. And they get mad at God. Psalm 103.20 says that angels hearken unto the voice of God's word. 
All right. So we give voice. I've said this many times. We as Christians give voice to the word of God on this earth. When we speak the word of God in faith, the written word, listen, by prophetic words, even given by the Holy Spirit. And you want to know what else he added to that? Praying in tongues. He, the Holy Spirit said, when, when my people pray in tongues, I am speaking. Remember, you're the one do, you're doing the speaking, but the Holy Spirit's giving the words. Are you right? Are you, are you right? You following me? He's the one giving the words. He said, when, when my people pray in tongues, he goes, I'm even commanding my angels in those tongues. And he told me a long time ago, he said, if my people aren't praying in tongues, you pass up blessings. Because you would have never thought in your natural mind to pray for that certain thing. It takes the Holy Ghost who knows everything to pray the perfect will of God. So here's what the angels hearken to. They hearken to when you speak the written word in faith. They hearken to the prophetic word. Because when you're operating in the prophetic, it's the Holy Spirit speaking through you. You're speaking by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. That's why the enemy hates the written word of God the prophetic spoken word of God, and tongues. Someone getting this? It's interesting how it says, if you pray in the tongues, or if you speak in the tongues of what? Men and of angels. So there's a reason why the word of God, when it talks about the gifts of the Spirit, all right, there's a reason why it says to desire earnestly the best gifts. And what does he go on to say? Especially to prophesy. What does that mean? It means let especially desire to have the inspiration of the Holy Spirit speaking through you. Because that's when it shifts things in the natural realm. Amen? Now, go to Isaiah 54, 17. Let me show you something here. I need you to get this. Listen, a disciple will want to know about this. A disciple wants to know, Lord, what do I have? What do I have? What resources do I have? What's backing me up in this spiritual battle that I'm on in this earth? Are you following me? A disciple wants to know everything. Amen? Wouldn't it be foolish for someone to go in the military, the army, and and they're in basic training and they're trying to teach them how to use a gun, they're trying to teach them all these things? He's like, I don't want to learn any of that. I don't want to learn any of that. I just want to praise the president. I don't, I don't want to learn how to, uh, how to fight. Are you, are you following me? <laughs> Stupid, right? We need to know everything that's available to us in the kingdom of God. Now look at Isaiah 54, 17. Oh, you're going to learn some things at Living Waters Chapel. Amen? Amen. We're going deeper. Now here we go. Isaiah 54, 17. It says this. Every, most of you probably know it. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Now, here's what you need to know. The Holy Spirit spoke this to me. He said the weapon won't prosper when you verbally condemn it because angels are getting involved in stopping that weapon coming against you. I guarantee you most Christians have not thought of the connection of angelic assistance with Isaiah 54, 17. Angels are more active and present in our life than you even know. If you don't rise up and speak up and verbally condemn those weapons, you will not have angelic assistance to stop them from prospering in your life. Now, the Holy Spirit said this, said that many things happen in a Christian's life that could have been avoided if they have learned how to follow the instructions in the Word of God, which would activate and promote the work of angels in their life. Now, are you ready for this? Oh, here we go. And this is interesting that Julie's teaching the kids about unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is another hindrance to angelic assistance in your life. Go with me to Matthew 18. Let me show you something here. You may have never saw this passage in the light of angelic assistance in our life. Matthew 18, 21. How many want angelic assistance in our life? In your life? Me. I do. Hello. Yes. 
Here we go. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times, Jesus said to him. I do not say up to you seven times, but up to 70 times seven. In other words, all the time. Don't stop forgiving. That's a way of saying that, right? Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servant. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe me, what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, I will pay you all. And he would not. But went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all they all they had done been done. Then his master, after that he had called him, said to him, "You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I have had pity on you?" And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father will also do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Wow. Do I I even need to even go on about this? I will because I want to tie it into something. But that's powerful. Amen. The word speaks for itself. Amen. The unforgiving servant had a problem not forgiving a person that owed him money, right? Verse 35 says something very interesting that's key. He said this, it says that we are to forgive from our heart. Oh, come on, here we go. We are to forgive from our heart. What does that mean? The unforgiving servant, here's what the unforgiving servant did. He kept playing that trespass over and over in his imagination, in his thought life, in his heart. The Holy Spirit spoke this to me. He said, if a person keeps playing a trespass or the wrong of another individual against them in their imagination, they have not forgiven that person. That offense is still active in their heart. Oh boy, it's getting quiet in here. How do I know, Pastor James? How do I know if I've forgiven? If it stops playing in your imagination. If you stop thinking about it. When you stop thinking about it, you've forgiven. But if it keeps playing, that offense is active. Say active. Active. That person who keeps playing it over and over in their heart, in their imagination, in their thought life, they haven't rooted that offense out of their heart. That's why it keeps playing. Here, listen to this. You cannot meditate on something that's not already planted in your heart. That's why the Word of God says, get the Word in your heart. And that's the only way you can start meditating on it. Are you following me? You meditate on something that's in your heart. So you keep overplaying, replaying. You're meditating on. You're fuming over this thing. You're still in unforgiveness. Oh, that's some good pastoral counseling right there. They meditate on that offense in their heart from the past and it turns into an unforgiveness. And guess what? That unforgiveness, when it keeps going, it turns into what? Bitterness. A root of bitterness. And that's when people's bodies start to feel it. Are you following me? Because every root has a fruit. There is no fruit without a root. Why do I sound like Dr. Seuss up here this morning? Are you following me? 
Now, here's a, another interesting point about that parable in connection to angelic assistance in our life. Are you ready? It says the master, which is our heavenly father, it says he will turn you over to the torturers. I like the King James Version that says tormentors, which are what? Demons. The kingdom of darkness. Not that God wants to do that. But you need this revelation. He's holy. You cannot approach God with unforgiveness in your heart. Are you following me? Don't think that you have favor with God as you're replaying that offense over and over and letting it stew on the inside of you. Don't thank you because God is holy. Amen? So obviously, if it says that he turns you over to the tormentors, which that person did it to themselves. Hello? That's a spiritual law. It just happens. You hold on forgiveness. That's a spiritual law. You're going to give yourself over to demonic spirits to torment you in life. You get it? That doesn't mean it's the will of God. It just means that's what happens because God is holy. Are you following me? So obviously, there is no angelic assistance for the unforgiving Christian because the demons or tormentors are given permission. If angels had permission, they would hold off the tormentors. Are you following me? Angels, so this means this, that angels are paying attention to your relationships with other people. Angels are able to tell, they're able to discern when unforgiveness is present in your heart. Why? Because it radiates from your spirit man. Listen, you think every, <laughs> you think everything that you think about in your imagination is private? Oh, only God knows that. Wrong! Are you following me? People have a problem with this. They're like, oh no, only God knows my thoughts. Wrong! Because your imagination is your spirit man communicating with the spirit realm. They see it. Oh, that, that goes over like a lead balloon. I had someone fighting me, with me, fighting with me. Oh, God doesn't know. I said, okay, okay, say if I'm wrong. Me telling you that, what does that do? He says, well, it makes me think of my thoughts a little bit more before I think it. Well, is that a bad thing? Listen, listen, here we go. Listen to this. So that unforgiveness radiates from your spirit, man. Okay? In fact, when... Okay, we'll get there. Listen. Thank you, Holy Ghost. The Word of God is light. The Bible says, it says the Word is light, right? It's a light unto your feet, right? A light unto your path. When you meditate on the Word of God, when you speak the Word of God, when you act on the Word of God, your spirit, man, is full of light. Are you following me? This ain't new age. This is the word. Hello, somebody. Some of y'all are all paranoid. See, this is what the devil did. He, he, it made Christians paranoid to talk about the supernatural because the new age has hijacked it and they simply tried to take God out of it. Are you following me? So angels, by the way, are spirit beings. They are full of light. In fact, like I said earlier, some manifest as lightning. Okay? They're full of light. It accounts in the Bible. It says the angels, when they appeared to the shepherds, it said a light shone all around about them. Are you following me? Angels are attracted and drawn to the light of God's Word. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all, the Word of God says. When you're abiding in Christ, you're walking in the light. Are you following me? So in the Word of God, in fact, righteousness is always referred to or compared to as light, right? Okay, so unrighteousness is darkness. Righteousness is light. Are you following me? All right. Now, what's, look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 talks about false apostles uh, and deceitful workers. It says transforming themselves into um, apostles of Christ. And then it says, and no marvel, because Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. That literally means he masquerades as an angel of light. But he can't hide the darkness that's made up in him since he rebelled against God. Are you following me? So it's evident in the spirit realm when someone's walking in the light or they're in darkness. Angels see it and know it. Are you following me? I mean, heck, we know it. When you're around someone who's filthy and into stuff they shouldn't be, you can feel a dirty presence on them. Are you following me? Yeah. 
You can discern it. Amen. Amen. I know when someone comes up to me, you know, pastoring, and they come up to me, and, and you can just tell there's a darkness about them if they're not walking with the Lord. Amen? Are you, are you doing all right? So Satan has, has to masquerade himself. These false prophets, false apostles, these false workers, they have to masquerade, right? So meaning their true identity is spiritual darkness. So angels can see the difference in the spiritual realm. Now, so angels have one mission, and it's to minister for and to Christians that are abiding in Christ, abiding in the will of God, or walking in the light. Angels are sent to help you to fulfill the will of God for your life. That's why it's so dangerous to be out of the will of God for your life. Because you're hindering heaven's resources from helping you. Now, let's talk about guardian angels. Some of y'all probably have, have a question about guardian angels. Do we all, for, the, for our whole life, do we all have guardian angels that are around us all the time? You believe that? Right? We're all taught that, right? We all have guardian angels. Here's the, unless the Lord specifically assigns one for a mission, I do not believe that we do. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you something here that I bet you probably have not seen. Are you ready for this? Go to Matthew 18.10. Let me show you something here. Christians that believe that we all have guardian angels all the time for our whole life, they, they use this scripture here to say, see, we have guardian angels our whole life. You doing all right? Look at this. Matthew 18.10. It says, Jesus said these words. He said, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. He's talking about children. For I say to you that in heaven, there are angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. All right. The Holy Spirit, when I read that, I mean, it was like just a... a a Polaroid flash of light that went off in me. Are you ready for this? Here we go, of Revelation. Here's what this is saying. Children do have angels assigned to them. Are you ready for this? Up until the age of accountability. Oh my goodness. Children have angels assigned to them, but only up until the age of accountability. Now, what does that mean? Okay, listen to this. Meaning, up until the age that they're old enough to make Jesus Christ the Lord of their life and choose to obey and fear or reverence God in their life. Because we just read in Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps round about those who what? Fear Him. So when they get to that age where they, they, they know enough they can make a decision on their own to make Jesus Christ the Lord of their life and to fear the Lord. At that point right there, that's when the angelic assistance cuts off and there's something they need to do to keep it in their life. So no, just even Psalm 34, 7 blows away the fact that we all have an angel, a guardian angel assigned to us our whole life. But a child does up until the age of accountability. Let me show you something here. Let me show you something else in connection to children and angels. Let me show you something that the Holy Spirit showed me about the ministry of angels to children. Go with me to Matthew chapter 2. Uh, the Holy Spirit brought to my remembrance the accounts of an, of an angel appearing to Joseph in a dream. Matthew chapter 2. Children are very near and dear to the heart of God. Are you following me? They're innocent God provides an angel with uh, for them. Are you following me? Now, I want to show you something here. Let me let me just look at this real quick again here. Their angels. It's talking about the the children. I mean, how can you get around it? Look at this, Matthew 2:13. Look at this. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph, underline it, in a dream saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you, the wor bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Now go with me to 19, uh, Matthew 2, just down the road a little here, to verses 19 through 21. Look at this. Now when Herod was dead, 
So here we have that period of time. The angel said in a dream to Joseph, take Jesus, take Mary, take them out of this area because Herod's going to try to kill Jesus. Now, that time's gone. Now, when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared, underline it, in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, arise, take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. The Holy Spirit said that the angel, the angel that is assigned to the child, are you ready for this? The angel that's assigned to a child will oftentimes try to send messages to the parent or the adult that's responsible for the child. Yes, yes. Did you get that? Oh, think about this. The parent or the adult that has responsibility over that child, that child's angel that's assigned to them will try to get the attention of the adult to protect the child. Oh, we're going deeper. Amen? I want you to notice something here. That the angel warned Joseph in a dream both times to move Jesus and the family to protect them, protect Jesus from getting killed by Herod's soldiers. Angels can communicate to us in our dreams. Has anybody ever had a dream in here and it was, you knew it was an angel trying to communicate something, a message, something to you? See, most Christians are afraid to admit that because they think that they're, they're, they're betraying God. They're betraying the Holy Spirit. No. The Word of God says here, the angel came to him in his dream. It's scriptural. It's biblical. Are you following me? So angels can communicate to us in our dreams. Now remember, if it's an angel of God, it's always going to lead us closer to Jesus. It's always going to be in line with the Word. If an, if an angel tries to come to you in your dream, or even an angelic encounter that pulls you away from Christ, that's not in line with the Word, it's a false angel. Are you following me? So there's boundaries to know here. But listen, what you think is a dream, listen to me then, is really a spiritual reality of an angel or a ministering spirit com- communicating with uh, with you. Isn't that powerful? A lot of our dreams, we just kind of think of our dreams as just, oh, well, you know, you just kind of throw it off to the side. But you were really having an encounter. You were having... Spiritual reality. You were having an encounter with an angelic being. You were having an encounter with the Holy Spirit. You were having a, with Jesus even in a dream. Are you following me? So they they want to communicate. When they communicate with us, they're trying to get something across to us, something that's significant. The, an angel of God is not going to waste their time just to make you feel good to give you goosebumps. Are you following me? If they appear to you, if you have an encounter with them, if they're coming to you in your dreams and they're trying to tell you something, there's a good reason. There is a purpose. Amen? Now, I want you to notice something else. That that communication from the angel did not happen in Joseph's brain, but rather in his spirit man that does not sleep. If he was sleeping, it obviously was not taking place in his fleshly brain. Which tells me this, that your dreams, your imagination are spiritual and they never sleep. Your your dream world, your imagination, your spirit man never sleeps. So we we know that this message wasn't received through his brain because it said he came in through the dream. So communication in your spirit man... Uh, in your spirit man, is connected to your imagination. It, your s- imagination is the movie screen of your spirit man. Are you following me? The Holy Spirit, angels, demon spirits, unfortunately, they try to communicate with us through your imagination. The Holy Spirit, listen, demon and uh, demons and the kingdom of darkness, they try to communicate with us as well. And that's why people's imaginations are out of control. Their thought life is out of control because they're trying to take hold of, they're trying to influence, the communi- influence us and communicate with us from the wrong kingdom. Now listen to me. We're going to go deeper. If we would pay attention to the thoughts that flow through our thought life, 
through our imagination, we would realize that the Holy Spirit, angels, and even demons, they're trying to constantly communicate and influence us from the spirit realm. What's my scriptural evidence on that? 2 Corinthians 10.5. 2 Corinthians 10.5 in the King James Version uh, tells us this. It says to cast down, what? Imaginations. And it tells us to cast down imaginations after it says, you're not warring in the flesh, but you're warring in the spirit. And it, so it connects the imagination with the spirit realm. With your spirit man. Are you following this? I'm trying to help. Listen, I'm telling you, if you will pay attention to what thoughts are flowing and what pictures are coming into your mind, you will be able to reject the things from the enemy a lot quicker and receive what is from God. Amen? Um, So the imagination is for spiritual communication. Say that. Say the imagination is for spiritual communication. All right, so it's the movie screen of our spirit, man. That is communication to and from the spirit realm. Listen, here's what you got to understand: you're not just receiving a message. You're, when you're thinking something, when you meditate on the word, when you you're sending a message. Your imagination is your your it's your receiver and your transmitter. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Guess what the evidence? So we stand on the word, right? The words, the word, the promises of the word are spiritual blessings. What's the evidence of things not seen? When you start to see it in your imagination, you can see yourself walking in on it, on that blessing. Are you following me? This is why you see a level of these Tony Robbins and these new age people and stuff and motivational speakers. Here's what they did. You see them have a level of success in the natural realm because they've taken a piece parts of the word these spiritual laws and they put them into motion but they're doing it without christ while the church is too paranoid to hear about it because oh that's new age no it's not the devil wants to keep you dumb the devil wants to keep you stupid from these things are you following me the evidence of things not seen. Not seen is talking about your, your physical eye. Not seen in the natural realm. But you see it in your imagination, in your spirit realm. So when you are picturing yourself, when you read the Word and you see a promise and you start to picture yourself, you're transmitting that thing out into the realm of the Spirit. And that's something that the angels want to get involved in. Are you following me? Man, we're going deep today. Hallelujah. The imagination is for spiritual communication. I I was ministering a a while back to some precious lady at the altar. She had um, a um, something going on in her physical body. And I said, okay, I need you to, you know, picture yourself. Jesus took stripes on his back. Picture yourself being healed. Can you picture yourself? And she's like, no, I can't picture it. It's like there's a total block right there. We know who that is, right? I said, okay, let's do a little exercise. At least picture a pink elephant for me. I can't do it. Immediately, she just shut it down. She couldn't do it. You know there's a demon involved with that then. There's a demon blocking it. Are you following me? We got to learn how to use our imagination. God created our imagination. And he gave it to That's our spiritual form of communication. Right? So remember, your spirit man, your thought life, your imagination connects with the kingdom of God. And then we need to speak something. Something has to come through your physical body for it to impact the natural realm, either in spoken words or in action. I know, it's deep. It's deep. But we got to learn these things as Christians. We can't let the kingdom of darkness take all of this while we sit back and get our butts kicked. Amen. Amen. So the enemy is always trying to attack and influence influence us to give in to negativity, to give in to sin, to give in to distractions for this reason, and maybe a reason you've never considered. Ready? To hinder and cut off the help of angels in your life. When Daniel started praying, it said God released an angel immediately to send the revelation of what uh, what, uh, Daniel was seeking. But then it said a demonic spirit hindered hindered that that angel from coming. 
a demonic spirit, a principality, the kingdom of darkness was hindering it, not God. So Daniel fasted and prayed for 21 days. That fasting and prayer, listen, it caused the angel, God's angel, to overcome the kingdom of darkness, which means that our actions on earth controls, come on, the strength of those angels. Are you following me? Is this not mind-boggling? I mean, see, we just thought, oh, you know, if I need an angel, God's just going to do that. No, no, no. We have a part to play in this whole thing. Okay, that's why we don't fall into fear. That's why we don't fall into negativity. Amen? Don't ever forget this. The activity and functions of angels in your life is more dependent upon your thoughts, your words, your actions, more than they are on God doing something for you. Or randomly doing something for you. Now go with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Oh, oh, all you guys, man, you're going to start to walk in the power of God. You guys are going to start to receive blessings and people in the area are going to say, man, I'm noticing that all these Living Waters people are walking in such a blessing. Man, they're walking in such victory in favor of the Lord. Why? Because you're, use, you're learning how to use your spirit, man, connected with the Holy Ghost, connected with God's holy angels. Are you following me? Ooh, glory to God. Mark chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Look at this. Immediately, the Spirit drove him, Jesus, into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days and tempted by Satan and was with wild beasts. And then it says something real interesting. And the angels ministered to him. Now, when people read that, immediately, you know what they say? Well, that was Jesus. How many of you know, as a Christian, we're a part of his body? In fact, we're so important that we sit with Christ in heavenly places. That wasn't just Jesus. This is available for the whole body of Christ. You understand that? Oh, listen. Now, now I want to. So that's one account in Mark about the, the temptation of Jesus. Go with me to Matthew chapter 4. I want to look at the account in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Verses 10 and 11, just two verses. I'm, all, I'm, I'm plowing, I'm, I'm almost done. Are you hanging in there? Matthew 4, 10 and 11, it said, Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. The Word of God says uh, that the... The devil left Jesus, Jesus' presence, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Has anybody ever asked the question, so the angels weren't ministering to Jesus when he was being tempted? Has anybody ever thought of that? It says when the devil left, the angels came. Now, (laughs) listen to this. I'm intrigued by this passage, by this account. How did the angels minister to Jesus? Now, I'm going to talk about why the angels didn't come until after the devil left. But listen, they ministered to Jesus. Just their very presence, the presence of angels around you, they strengthen you. And and it says says that there was wild beasts, so they probably protected Jesus. How many of you know they protect us from wild beasts? Amen? All right. So here's so angels carry the manifest presence of God of the, on them, and because of that, their presence strengthens us. Okay, they constantly, like I said, travel to and from between heaven and earth. They carry the atmosphere of heaven on them. All right, but why weren't the angels helping Jesus when he was being tempted by Satan? It, when I read this, immediately the Holy Spirit just gave me a flash of revelation. See, you got to start asking for revelation because the Holy Spirit will give it. Amen. Are you following me? Listen to this. Because remember, the, who led Jesus to be tempted into the wilderness? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Jesus had to overcome it. Jesus had to overcome the temptation without angelic help so he could condemn sin and that temptation in the flesh. You ever thought of that? Think about that. The Holy Spirit sent Jesus to get tempted for this reason, to be an overcomer. Because Jesus overcome temptation, we can too when we abide in Him. 
But Jesus had to do it with angelic assistance. Jesus overcame the well, uh, the world, and we can too. Are you following me? Because Jesus did it, we can too when we abide in Him. Amen? Look at Matthew 26. See, those are, that's the importance of being, uh, is praying for revelation and understanding of the Word. Because the Holy Spirit will just start popping revelation as you're reading. Biblical meditation will unleash revelation. Biblical meditation will release revelation, Holy Spirit revelation. You getting it? Here we go. Matthew 26, 50 through 54. But Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, get this, and He will provide me with more more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Now, so Jesus said this. He said He could pray to His heavenly Father. And he could ask for 12 legions of angels. Now, a legion of angels, a legion is about 6,000. So 6 times 12, Jesus was saying, I could pray to my heavenly Father and he'll send 72,000 angels to deliver me. But listen, here's why he didn't. Because he had to fulfill the prophecy of his death, burial, and resurrection. That's why he didn't ask. Here's my point. My point is this. It is absolutely scriptural and biblical to ask our Heavenly Father for angelic assistance. Jesus didn't do it because he had to die. That's the only reason why he didn't. Are you following me? When's the last time you prayed to God to give you angels to encamp you and to help? Right? Okay, we got one. We got two. Hey, we got three. All right. Hey, we got four. I've heard people, when they lost keys or something, they pray, God, send an angel to help me find this. And they end up finding it like that. So we as Christians need to have an awareness of angels in the spirit realm. Jesus was aware of what his resources were. He was available. What he had at his command... Come on, in the kingdom of God. But he didn't do it. He didn't do it because he had to. But he was giving us a clue. You can ask your heavenly father for angelic assistance. Elijah prayed his servant's eyes, or Elisha prayed that his servant's eyes would be open to see the angelic army around him for help. Remember that account? And what did it do? It took fear away. See, when there's angelic help around you, it takes fear away. When you're aware of their presence, when you seek God for Him to send angelic help, it takes fear away. Why? Because the atmosphere of heaven is around you. And as it is on earth, as it is in heaven, they bring the atmosphere of heaven and it melts away that fear. Come on. Jesus had angelic help to... Here's the deal. Oh, go with me to Luke 4. Sorry. Luke 4. Don't worry, I'll get you out of here soon here. This is just too important to, to let it go. Luke four twenty eight through 30. Look at this. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath at Jesus and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him... Down over the cliff. Then, did anybody ever notice this one? Then passing through the midst of them, he went his own way. Jesus had angelic help to make him invisible to his haters that were trying to kill him and throw him over the cliff. See, that was supernatural angelic help in action. And now I've heard testimonies where there were missionaries, where soldiers were coming to get them. They were looking for them. And they were standing right there. And the people walked right on by just like they were invisible. Angels were surrounding them and making them invisible. I know, I'm telling you, we need that, that kind of divine protection in this day that we're heading in. Amen? Look at Hebrews 13, 1 and 2. 
We're going to need more angelic assistance, not less. Amen? In these end times. You need to be aware of it and start believing it. Hebrews 13, verses 1 and 2. It says, let brotherly love continue and do not forget to entertain strangers for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Now, this says to let brotherly love continue and to entertain strangers. Now, and I'm on my last page right there, I promise. Here we go. Now, so walking in brotherly love and entertaining strangers could possibly lead to an angelic encounter in your life. Strangers could literally be angels in human form. You understand that? Several accounts in the Word of God reveal that angels were walking as human form on this earth. They even ate. Are you following me? They did human things, okay? So here's what the Holy Spirit wanted me to tell you. The next time you want to act rude to strangers out in public, you might be directing that rudeness to an angel of God. Here's why. Because God is testing your love for people. Oh, I just, I just felt the presence of God increase on me right there. In my last passage, and I'm done, Psalm 91. Psalm 91, you better be careful who you're being rude to out in public because not only do you represent Jesus, that should be good enough reason, but you might also be being rude to one of His angels. Psalm 91. <clears throat> he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His, his truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness." nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you will look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you. I want to point out real quick, all of these blessings of Psalm 91, the Holy Spirit spoke this to me. It's angelic assistance. All of these blessings is angels doing this to protect you. It says, verse 10, No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands uh, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot, because he... Here it is. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. The Lord's taking credit, you understand, because the Lord created the angels. If the angels help you, God gets the credit. Amen. Not the angels. Are you following me? But the angels are doing the work of your protection here. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. I want you to notice, make a note to yourself when you go home this week, the, the conditions... Of all of those benefits of protection hinge on the scripture of the verses, verse 9 and 14 through 16. All the conditions of safety and protection are based on the conditions of verse 9 and 14 through 16. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refu refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. Notice it says dwelling place. You're consistently abiding in Him. And in the New Testament, that means abiding in who? Christ. Amen? It means, it, it, does, it means not to go back and forth between the flesh, the devil, and God. It means abiding, remaining faithful. And if you will do that, and you set your love upon God, it says all of these benefits, I will send, I will give angels charge over you. I will command them to watch over you. And they will deliver you from anything the enemy would try to do. Amen? Let's stand up in this place. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.
Thanks for listening to the Revival Now podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and download the Luke 418 Radio Network app at Luke418Radio.com. I'll be back next week for another anointed and life-changing Revival Now podcast. Thank you.